What is going on, my people? This is your boy, Nathan Crankfield. Very excited to share this with you today. This is a talk. Actually, I used this outline um, from two years ago when I first met Father Meyer. I went to speak at his parish, and he asked me to give a talk to his youth group of Catholicism versus Protestantism and comparing the two, why one should be Catholic versus being Protestant, or just non denom uh, Christian or, you know, any number of things that are out there. Right. So, yeah, so this is a heavy, this is, I mean, it's not heavy topic. Heavy typically means like bad. This is a more lighthearted topic. No, it's actually pretty thick. I don't know what I'm saying. So it's, it's an important topic. Let's put it that way. It's very important. And so I'm going to go through some of my journey of how I became Catholic, but the most important thing I'm going to hit on today is my top five reasons of why somebody should be Catholic, why I am Catholic now. So I'm not going to just, it's not just like a, this isn't really going to be like a um, personal story of my journey to Catholicism as much as it's going to be the reasons why I'm choosing to be Catholic today, tomorrow, and until I'm dead, right? So that's what this is mainly going to be focused on. Uh, and there's going to be a lot in there. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different things today. Um, again, just first and foremost, you know, I always say this stuff at the end, but I'm trying to get a little bit better at repping different things. But first, I want to encourage you, if you have not gone and either subscribe to the podcast or left us a review. I highly encourage you to do that. I saw that we had last year 119 people listen to our podcast more than any other podcast, and we don't have 119 reviews. Now, as I continue to say things that piss people off, as this podcast probably will, I get like either one or five star reviews. That's pretty much all we get. So <laughs> if you don't think it matters, it does. If you want other people to hear this, if you do enjoy the podcast, um, know that as I continue to try to share the truth, um, and to be bold in my faith and in, in the things that we believe, um, that there's a lot of negativity that kind of bogs us down. So if you can help counter, counter that, uh, it's greatly appreciated. So I get a kick out of going on seeing the one stars. Um, and again, like I, I don't do this to like try to grow it to 10 million people listening, whatever happens happens, but you know, we still want to try to fight against <laughs> the one star reviews that people just give us because they don't agree with what we say. So, so there's that. Um, but Catholic versus Protestant, you know, one of my favorite quotes about this, uh, this topic here is, I don't know who says it or where it came from. Um, let me see if I can, let me see if I can find it real quick. Boom, there it is. So, uh, Sophia Institute <laughs> Press, the Sophia Press, uh, shared it, um, from Dr. David Anders. And it says the Catholic Church saved my marriage. It's from his book, The Catholic Church Saved My Marriage. And it says poorly formed Catholics become Protestants and well-formed Protestants become Catholics. And so that's somebody who converted to Catholicism. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, if, if you look at people like, I was looking at this actually like a New York Times article from way back. I don't know when it was from. It's in their archives though. And it says, you know, Cardinal John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton, um, Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day have uh, major biographies and have become um, converts to the Catholic faith, many of whom were Protestants before that, mainstream Protestants or, or members of mainstream Protestant churches. And so uh, there's a lot to that. Now, my journey, if you remember, I'm going to give it really quickly. So I was baptized Lutheran. My dad was Baptist. I went to a Methodist preschool, kindergarten, started Catholic school at 13, became Catholic. I always say that was kind of more of an emotional thing. Like I was just really drawn to it and, and we uh, weren't going to church as much by that time in my life. And so I was going to church mostly at school. So I was most exposed to Catholicism, going to Catholic schools. In college is where I feel like I had my real intellectual conversion. So my journey in college was really kind of, I took, it, I took college as an opportunity in, in most areas of my life to kind of clean slate and just kind of start from scratch and be like, who do I want to become? Who is God calling me to be? How's he calling me to live? And I was really drawn to a lot of social justice things at that time, which is why I'm trying to remember what I have on the schedule. I don't know if it's next week or sometime soon. I'm releasing my podcast on why I'm conservative and that whole journey, which is I think it's going to be another really fun one to record. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I was really social justice driven and loved like praise and worship music and all that kind of stuff. And I still like some, I still like some of that stuff now, but. Uh, that drove me to really look into a lot of evangelical churches and some of those big, you know, mega churches. 
And we had one right down the road in Frederick, Maryland. I can never remember the name of it. Um, but I went there a decent bit when I was in college. And I looked up a lot of information to try to better understand what are the differences between Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, et cetera, right? And I think it's something that we don't really do a good job. I think we don't do a good job of forming Catholics in general, right? I think we fail in a lot of ways um, in church formation, but that's one that I think a lot of people don't really know about. And so it doesn't help when people get out and they get more drawn into one or the other. They start dating somebody who is Baptist or Methodist or non-denominational, right? Because if you're not formed in your Catholic faith and you don't know what's wrong with the other churches, you're going to be really easy to fall into those. And so as I go through these, these five reasons and the rest of the stuff that I'm going to share today, I think it's really important to understand a few things to lay some groundwork, right? So as you know, if you've listened to this podcast before today, I'm not somebody who likes to strive to be like politically correct. I'm not going to strive to sugarcoat things that I think are true. Obviously, I don't want to like, I'm not going to be like, all Protestants are going to hell. I'm not going to teach anything that's outside of the catechism or that is just absolutely false, right? So I think it's important to, to kind of lay that out, um, that I'm not going to like try to be super nice. I think it's one of the problems that we have today. I think a lot of Protestants don't become Catholics because we in the church have this kind of approach that whatever, like we all, it's all the same thing, right? We all worship the same, worship the same God and that it's all basically the same. And I think that that's really sad that a lot of people miss out on so much goodness that's offered by the church, namely the sacraments um, and the fullness of the faith, because we're like so nice and afraid to like call things what they are. Back in the day when people like denied the Immaculate Conception of Mary, we called them heretics, right? Like, <laughs> and we were like pretty harsh on heretics back in the day. Um, back in the day when people denied the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, we called them heretics, right? When people said you don't need to go to confession, like that that's wrong, that was heresy. The only thing that's changed with that is over is time, and we got a lot nicer. Now I'm not out here trying to tell everybody that you're a heretic. What I think is true is this next quote that I want to share that I'm pretty sure comes from Fulton Sheen, um, that basically essentially goes like this. There's only 10 people in the world who disagree with the Catholic Church. The rest of them disagree with what they, be, they think the Catholic Church teaches. And man, I'll tell you what, like I've, I've dated Protestants in the past, had a lot of Protestant friends, especially when I was in the army. I was very involved with a lot of Protestant stuff. Um, and if that's not the truth, man, I tell you what, like when I got to asking people, especially the non-denoms about Catholicism, like it was amazing to me how little they knew. And now this is one of the reasons why I'm so mind blown by that is because like, it was really crazy to me to see Protestants in the army who I knew were patriots and conservatives who knew nothing about church history or the Catholic church. And so I'm like, if you, th this always like blew my mind. There's going to be several things I'm going to share here that just like blow my mind about how people are Protestants. Not everything. I don't think that every Protestant is like stubborn or stupid or like, ignorant i'm not saying that but i think that it's amazing to me how satisfied they can be with like very little information and just kind of take things there's a lot of assumptions that protestantism is built on right instead of like history and facts and, and scripture even and so uh one of the things like this analogy that i kind of made in my head back then that i shared with one of my friends uh when we were talking about protestantism because i kind of hit this point like my last year in the army when i was getting more bold in my faith and more bold in my political views and all this stuff. And I, I, stopped, I started speaking up when people would say, when I'd be in conversations with people and they'd be like, yeah, it's basically all the same, right? Like we all worship the same Jesus. I started being like, no, it's not the same. Like what, what you do on Sunday, what I do on Sunday, it's not the same. And if you're a Catholic, like obviously you want to be somewhat well-formed to be able to read uh, up and have like answers to some of the basic things before you start saying that, right? Because you don't want to say that and then not be able to explain it. But you do, like, I think, have an obligation to say that most of the time, right? There can be times, right, if you're at, like, your, your grandchild's uh, baptism or, like, some family event where it's just, like, not the moment. You know what I mean? You're talking to your in-laws or something. It's, like, you don't have to go, like, full, you know, guns blazing every time. But eventually, like, you should share with somebody that that's not true, right? Like, if you believe in the true presence of the Eucharist, if you believe in sacraments and you go to Mass because you believe in that, 
then when somebody goes to a mega church on Sunday and, and you go to mass and they say it's the same thing, like you can't nod your head with that, right? Like you can't just be like, yeah, you're right. It is the same. It's not the same. Um, and so one of the things that got me all the time with these people, I would say, you know, my friends and stuff, and I'd be like, no, it's not the same. And what do you know about Catholicism? And like genuinely ask, right? Like not with like harsh tones, but just be like, what do you know about the Catholic church? Um, and I'd be like, man, isn't it crazy how like we, we watch, I was just watching a video last night on YouTube about like clowning people who don't know American history, right? It, like the Jay Leno videos, right? Like he's interviewing people on the streets. I think it's so funny and depressing. It's both funny and depressing. It's terrible how dumb people are, but he's like, how many, how many stars are on the flag? And people are like, uh, 32, like this one woman was literally like 32 and he pointed to a flag on like that was waving that was outside. And she was like, oh, it's moving too fast. I can't count them. And he's like, are you serious right now? He asked people to name how many Avengers they could name, how, as many as they could, and then did the same with presidents and showed like six people who named more Avengers than they could U.S. presidents. And I'm like, I know these friends of mine. I'm like, that frustrates you, right? Like it frustrates you that people don't know American history. That's why we see so much in, in world history, right? That's why we see the rise of socialism over and over again, right? In every generation. And uh, I would ask him, I'd be like, man, the idea of reading the gospels and then jumping ahead, right? So like reading the gospels, even the letters, right? Let's say, you know, reading the gospels and letters. So let's, let's, let's give it some buffer room and say, you, you know, Christian, the Christian church from, uh, you know, Jesus's birth up until the, the end of the first century, right? A hundred AD. And that's generous, right? And we'll give you some buffer room here with the, the letters and all this stuff, Acts of the Apostles. Now let's go and say you jump ahead then until 2004. Let me see here. When was Elevation Church founded? Because we had a lot of Elevation people in uh, North Carolina, right? Because it's in Charlotte. So I was in Fayetteville. And we had a ton of Elevation people. 2006. So let's say you jumped ahead 1900 years, right? Year 100 AD. You jump ahead 1,906 years. Uh, for, for those out there not good at math, that's 1,906 years of church history. And you pick up with Stephen Furtick, who launched the church in 2006. And the only things you care about and think that your theology should be founded on is scripture, right? Events and, and things that were written in the first, first century. And then jump all the way ahead and you read like, John Eldridge and books by Stephen Furtick and books by Michael Todd and all these pastors and stuff like from, from this century, right? Is it like, is it that not concerning? That's the same, I would tell them, as somebody who knew about the Revolutionary War, right? The Boston Tea Party and all that stuff, and then jumped ahead to like the Obama administration. It'd be more like jumping ahead to the Trump administration. And they knew everything from like 2016 till now. And they knew about the Revolutionary War. You're missing a good chunk of American history there, right? And that's what a lot of like high schoolers kind of do, right? Like, I mean, you kind of, we have all these young people who are like into socialism that were conditioned to hate Trump. And we see so many people that it's like, do you, like when people are like, America's always been terrible. And it's like, do you not remember like World War I and World War II where we literally like saved the world? And now this isn't a, a pro-America podcast. I mean, the podcast in general is pro-America, but um, that's not what this episode's about, but do you understand the difference there? Like, or the, the analogy there is how do you, how do you study something and care about something so much when it comes to your country? And you say that from the beginning, you know, I, you need to know, have a basic knowledge of American history. We you know, say that for people who want to become citizens, people, you hear conservatives, religious conservatives say to vote, you should be able to have to pass a, you know, American history test and all these different things. And it's like, well, what about your faith, dude? You don't need to know anything about, about the faith. Like church, church history just doesn't matter to you. So let me dive into these. This, this leads me to my, uh, perfectly, um, into my, my first reason why I want to become Catholic. But before that, I have my five reasons, my list of five. Before I dive deeper into church history, dude, the number, I, this, is, this is something that's so important. I'm so glad I just checked my list here. I, the number one reason why I'm Catholic is because I believe that God wants me to be. Let me say that again. The number one reason why I am Catholic is because I believe that God wants me to be. 
I can't tell you how many Catholics who have fallen away to different churches that I've known when you ask them, why did you start going to Elevation or to all these other churches? It's because I just felt really good because the music was great. Because I love, I love Pastor Stephen Furtick. He's funny. He makes things relatable. Uh, it gets me. I feel like I get something from it, right? Everything is, is I. It's very first person oriented. And that's the problem. The problem is that what, a lot of times when people fall away from the church, it's always other focus. When you ask somebody like myself, Emily, like somebody who knows the faith, and you ask them, why are you Catholic? Why do you remain Catholic? There's reasons. And I'm about to give you my top five reasons. Um, what's his name? Peter Kreef, Dr. Peter Kreef, one of my favorite books. He wrote a book called 40 Reasons Why I'm a Catholic. And it's like 110 pages. It's a great read, very quick. Each, each reason is like three pages. It's awesome. But the number one reason I'm Catholic is because I think God wants me to be. And I think you have to ask yourself, oh, this leads me to another story. There's so many stories. This is such a good topic, man. I love talking about this. Um, you have to ask yourself, why do I believe what I believe? Why am I what I am? And it's so funny because so many Protestants accuse Catholics, like especially your, your cradle Catholics, people who are you know, baptized as a baby and raised in the faith and to some degree, say you're only Catholic because your parents were Catholic. And it's like, dude, why are you Protestant? Do you have, like, you don't even know what you're protest protesting against. You don't even know what you object. And if you do know what you object, which I would say maybe 10 to 20% of them do, it's, it's misinformed. It's very misinformed. And so let me tell you the story. This is one of my favorite tales too. I was on, this is like movie, movie stuff, right? Movie stuff. My life's a movie, bro. No, it's really not. It's uh, pretty average, but Oh, it's amazing life. I have an amazing life, but my life isn't a movie. I don't know why I get on these little tangents. But anyway, so there I was. No shit, there I was on a, a rooftop in Afghanistan, right? And we were doing some stuff and special forces guys were coming back to like reload and all these things, right? And their chaplain happened to be there with us and it was a Sunday. And so obviously like, I'm out in the field for like two to three weeks. And so there's no mass. But I got my rosary out there, of course, and I had we had like a Bluetooth speaker. So I was actually able to listen to a previously downloaded Father Mike Schmidt's podcast. So I listened to like his homily and prayed the rosary. And he came up on the rooftop while I was doing radio duty on Radio Guard and uh, oh, radio duty. I don't know where I got that from, but I was on Radio Guard and I, he comes up and the chaplain, he's like a major. and He's talking with me and he tell, it was like i didn't even bring anything up he just like asked me what i was listening to and all this stuff and i told him i'm like yeah i'm catholic i'm doing this right, whatever and he's like oh wow he's like you know i was actually raised catholic but i think i want to say he was episcopalian at this point um and i'm like oh cool and he's like yeah i just really struggled you know with some like the teachings about mary and i was like gotcha and i, I mean i wasn't at a point i don't think where i could have really debated this guy on uh mary and theology at that point but i'm like yeah okay. You know, I, I wasn't even asking questions. He's just like opening up to me. And he's like, he's like, but I don't know, man, I might become Catholic again someday. He's like, there's this one thing that really gets me that, that always got me. He said, I had a history teacher. The guy wasn't even Catholic, but we were learning about like religions and history. And he said that every Protestant needs to have a good reason as to why they're not Catholic. Because this history teacher, like acknowledged the fact, this leads me back into church history. The number one reason why I'm Catholic not the number one reason, but reason number one in my list. He said, every good, every Protestant needs to have a good reason why they're not Catholic, because for 1500 years, everybody was Catholic. So if you're not going to be the thing that was the thing for 75% of what your religion, your religion's existence, you should have a reason as to why you're not. And I'm telling you, man, if you ask most of them, why are you not Catholic? There is not a good reason out there for it. If there's not an understanding of what you're rejecting. And I just, I, I feel like in this age of information, people need to take this more seriously and be willing to like actually learn about these things and have reasons why they're rejecting them. Because I'm telling, like, this was heresy back in the day, man. And heresy is a big deal. Heresy is a very big deal. The only thing worse than heresy is apostatizing. And that's when you know and, and believe the Catholic faith and reject it anyways, which is what you see with priests and bishops in Germany, priests and bishops here in the U.S., um, that know the faith have been trained in it and still reject it for all types of different reasons, which we're not going to get into today. But again, reason number one, point number one, I'm going to talk about is church history. So I talked about my analogy already with U.S. history, the importance of knowing history. I think all of us that are in the church 
typically would agree that like knowing history is important, generally speaking. Now, uh, one thing that I love about history, uh, another thing that I love, another great moment I had was, have you ever been in a Lifeway, the Christian, they're like Christian bookstores, right? It's like a Christian uh, Barnes and Noble, but much smaller. And I, I pulled up this, the same thing that I found one time in a Lifeway and Lifeway, they have some Catholic stuff, but they're definitely like, it's definitely Protestant, right? Like it's definitely dominated, heavy Protestant. You're not going to find like images of Mary and stuff in there, but you'll find like some Catholic books and Bibles. So one time I was looking at this chart, right? And they had this like big chart. And I don't know if it was for like religious studies or whatever. Like, I don't know who the hell would buy this thing, but other than Catholics, <laughs> I almost bought one. I wish I did sometimes. And it was this chart and it was re actually really cool. It had like a breakdown of what different churches believe and different denominations, right? So on the left hand, the first column, uh, you can imagine this, it was like Catholics, Lutherans, Methodist, Baptist, right? Anglican, um, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, non-denominational, evangelical. Um, what's the, oh, Pentecostal. I was like, what's the snake people? Um, the snake people is not a nice way to describe them. I apologize. The, uh, sometimes they play with the snakes though, but they're not snake people. That's not kind. But it had all the different denominations and it would have like different columns had different topics, right? And it was like, what do they believe about salvation? What do they believe about communion? What do they believe about forgiveness of sins or scripture? Or all these different things, right? And there were two things that really separated the Catholic Church from the rest of them. The first one was that the Catholic Church believes in scripture and tradition. Um, it's just not entirely based on scripture. And so I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But the other one that I thought was really wild that Protestants would be willing to put on their on their poster was it talked about who created the, that denomination um, and what year they created it. And so I have a, I have a list very similar now up, and you can see on here you know the Protestant Reformation was in 1517. Lutheranism slash Protestantism on this list that I'm looking at, and I'll put my links in the in the description if you guys want. Um, was created in 1517, right? In Germany, it even says where. Uh, the Mennonites, created in 1525 in Switzerland. Uh, Anglican, created in 1534, King Henry VIII in England. Calvinism, John Calvin, 1536 in Switzerland. Which I mean, like, isn't it just not great that like Calvinism and Lutheranism are named after the dudes? Like, I, I, that, that was one thing I never really, like, understood. It's like, this is literally named after, like, a human being that founded this. And it's not Jesus, right? Like, Christian has Christ in it because of Christ, and it was founded by Christ, right? So, like, Christian church. The Lutheran church has Martin Luther founded in it, be, or in it because it was founded by Martin Luther. That, to me, is a problem, right? Methodist, John Wesley, 1739. 1739. That means we're coming up on their 300th anniversary. That's pretty fresh. Not nearly as fresh as 2006 for, for <laughs> Elevation, but hot dog. Elevation just celebrated 15 years this year. Congrats, guys. Um, Latter-day Saint, Joseph Smith, um, also known as Mormons, 1830, New York, USA, America. Jehovah's Witnesses, 1870, Pennsylvania, great state of Pennsylvania. Pentecostalism, 1900s, Charles Parham, California, USA. Like, okay. That's great. Oh, we missed one. Roman Catholic Church founder, Jesus, comma, Peter, circa 30, location, Judea. Okay. Okay. Like that, that in and of itself, let's just start there. Let's just, let's just kick it off with that one. And I, I found this dude, I found this on this poster and I'm like, bro, this is literally like Protestants buy this. Like, how do you buy, like, these are some of the things, guys, I'm telling you, like, I, I'm, I just look at it, I'm like, how, like, talk, how, though? like, how, though, how, how do you do it? How do you look at that? Dog, Roman Catholic, Jesus, Peter, circa 30, Judea. And then you went, uh, let me see, 1,487 years until the next one. And it was a Martin Luther in Germany. 
So there's that. And so the church history, you can also go back and you can see, uh, you can also see the uh, apostolic succession. So if you don't know apostolic succession, apostolic succession means that Pope Francis descends from St. Peter, right? So St. Peter was the first Pope. We look at that in scripture when Jesus says, uh, changes his name from Simon. He says, I now call you Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build uh, my church, right? And so we believe from that through scripture and tradition um, that St. Peter was the first Pope. And, and that, that website, by the way, that I was on was not, it, it's religioustolerance.org, but you can find this list on a many different things and places. And this is not, I mean, I don't even know, this isn't even like a Christian website, right? This is just founders of Christian faith groups. You can find this everywhere. There's nobody that, that, that'll tell you that, that Lutheranism was founded by Jesus. And I mean, it doesn't, this doesn't make sense, right? Like if you know anything about history at all, you know that the Protestant Reformation was a thing, and that's what led to all of Protestantism. Now, Pope Francis was uh, became Pope March 13th, 2013. Before him, we had Benedict XVI. Now, I'm not going to Gospel of Matthew you and go through this whole list, because it's actually even longer than uh, the genealogy of Jesus, um, names-wise. But you can literally scroll on this list. Again, this is even a Catholic website. Um, and you can see Peter. After Peter was Linus, after Linus was Anacletus, after that was Clement, after that was Evaristus, and it literally scrolls all the way down. Like there's not a gap, right? Boniface, uh, John the first, Boniface two, Boniface was popping back in the day. Boniface four, John the fourth coming up. Like you can see who was Pope in year 752, Stephen the second right? Who became Pope in 18 or 817? Like you can literally look on the list and see it, right? So you can go through and were all these popes great and wonderful men and all of them saints? Absolutely not, right? We had some horrible saints or how are not horrible saints, horrible popes throughout the years. Um, but that's also one of my other points, not only the history of the church and the good stuff, but what about the bad history? One of my favorite quotes, I think I first read this in Letters to a Suffering Church by Bishop Barron. I think he has this quote in there. I should have looked it up so I could have it perfect. But I tried to find it and I couldn't before I started this. But it's a quote by some like Catholic thinker. And he, he says, he's being asked about like all the evil and like negativity in the church over the years. And he's like, if that doesn't guarantee uh, that we're the church that Jesus talked about when he said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, um, when Jesus in scripture talks about having one church, when he prays to the father that we'll be unified, that we will be one, um, when in, in the, in the creeds, when we say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the creed that's also said in many Protestant churches. Um, we believe that because even with all the horrific violence, infidelity, abuse, and terrible things that happen in the church, it's still around. Dude, do you know how many like countries have come and gone? Empires have come and gone in the last 2,000 years? Like religions that have ebbed and flowed, religions that have existed throughout time that have ebbed and flowed and kind of died off and things like that. Now imagine if they had this horrific track record like the Catholic Church does, right? Now I'm not going to straight up dog the church, and I know a lot of people like to focus only on the negativity. The church is also fed more people, clothed more people, taking care of more sick people, educated more people than any other organization in world history, right? So it's been a global force for good, um, much like the U.S. Navy. Uh, if you remember that commercial, it's from a commercial, if you didn't get that. But it, we've, done the, we've done an incredible amount of good, right? The saints and things like that throughout the years and just regular church, you know, the unnamed saints in heaven as well. But we've, had a, we've also had a lot of evil and, and, and scandal and corruption throughout the church history. And it's like a voluntary organization. Like, how does it remain? You mean to tell me that if Elevation Church, like Elevation Church, if they had the, the issues that we had, you think they will be around in 2,000 years? That's why I think these non-denom churches have to have this kind of like, like the, the church is so fluid to them. It can just kind of become whatever throughout time or whatever. It's like, it doesn't really have to like be anything specific because it kind of just ebbs and flows because you know that elevation after Stephen Furtick is even going to be around. Elevation is going to live for one lifetime. 
There's been so many popes. You can scroll down here throughout the 2000 years. So many of them. We still have a pope today. And sure, he's a little nutty every now and then, but this isn't a podcast about Pope Francis. We're here to talk about apostolic succession, the bad history of the church and the saints. Matthew Kelly in his books a lot of times talks about that, says that we're, we fed more people, clothed more people, taking care of more sick people, educated more people, um, baptized more people than any church in, in the, any, any, not any church, any group of any organization, any group of people in the history of the world which is pretty wild. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you want to read some dope uh, US history, learn about healthcare uh, and um, education system in the United States and how much the Catholics influenced that. You want to learn about feminism and the honoring of women. There's no religion in the world that honors a woman the way that the Catholic Church honors Mary and how much that influenced the world and actually led to more rights and things like that for women. Um, it made more sense to Catholics than anybody else because Catholics were the ones that prayed the rosary, were the ones that honor Mary the way that we ought to. When she says in scripture, that's quoted in scripture in Luke's gospel. From this, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. When she says that in the Magnificat, if you watch the chosen Christmas special, you saw this. Like we actually do that. All generations will call me blessed. It's in scripture. And people and, and other churches just treat her normal. The mother of Jesus, Mary, the Virgin, like a kid, you know what I mean? Give her a little bit, a little bit of respect, but they won't actually treat her the way that she ought to be treated. You know, the, the greeting of Elizabeth, the mother of my Lord has come to me. Who am I that the mother of my Lord has come to me? And then if we say she's the mother of the Lord, they're like, that's not true. And it's like, dog, it's in scripture. That's all you believe in is scripture. You still deny that. It doesn't make a ton of sense. Boom. Speaking of scripture, I'm not even looking at my list sometimes in these transitions. I'm telling you people, I'm on it today. The Lord is the Lord is good. That is for sure. All right. So now we're going to talk about scripture. Point number two, scripture. Right. Uh, so I'm, on, I'm using some Catholic answers here and a few other things I like to talk about. So the, here's some of the issues with scripture. Right. So, you know, the classic like uh, sola scriptura. And scripture versus tradition is kind of my third point. So I might kind of mix these two together here. Sola Scriptura basically is, is Latin for only scripture. And it's basically what uh, Martin Luther kind of started to promote when he uh, broke off from the Catholic Church, right? Now, mind you, this is something I think is really interesting about Martin Luther is he maintained that Mary was immaculately conceived. So the immaculate conception of Mary he believed in, and he continued to pray the rosary for the rest of his life. Uh, so I think that's interesting, but he started this idea of sola scriptura, which is only scripture. So if you know, Catholic church, we believe in scripture and tradition, uh, pretty much all Protestants only believe in scripture. Here's the problem with that. Uh, there's several, the most basic one, this is the one that gets me most worked up and is the most crazy to me is that. Nowhere in scripture does it say that you should only believe in scripture. So what, it's what you call a self-defeating claim, right? It's kind of like uh, we talk about the claim for relativism, right? When people are relativists, it means that you don't believe that there's any universal truth. Relativism is, goes along well with Protestantism because it's kind of this like you define your own reality, define your own truth. You have some, some Protestants who are very, very strong about like, What's in the Bible? What's in scripture, right? Um, and we'll, we'll kind of hold to like universal truth and use the Bible as their standard bearer for that, um, which is a move in the right direction. Uh, but relativism, I think, has come a lot out of the Protestant Reformation of kind of like, I can decide and interpret things for my own uh, and I can have my truth. I can have my interpretation. You can have yours and we can live together that way, right? It's liberalism. Uh, liberalism comes out of that idea to a certain extent. And so the problem with Sola Scriptura, just like the problem with relativism, the problem with relativism is to say there is no universal truth would in fact itself be a universal truth. Does that make sense? So if there's no truth, that's true for everybody, which makes it universal, which means that the, that itself is a universal truth, which means there must be some universal truth. And you can't say that there's no universal truth without 
the statement in and of itself being that there is a universal truth, that there is no universal truth for anyone. So that's the problem with that. The same thing with Sola Scriptura. So the claim is all you need is scripture. Like everything is Bible. All you need is scripture, no tradition. The, pro- the first problem with, with that is that the active form of it um, is that nowhere in scripture does it say, or I guess it's the passive problem, is that nowhere in scripture does it say that all you need is scripture, that everything should be based on scripture. Uh, the active problem with that is on the contrary. You know, uh, Jesus, St. Paul, um, other letter writers, like they talk about, you know, St. Paul specifically says, uh, I mean, 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 2, where he says, these things that you've seen me do, teach them to others who you can trust to show them to the world, you know, to continue to evangelize. Uh, St. James writes about this. St. John talks about um, the, the continue on the traditions, continue the things that you saw me do, continue the things that you've, we've taught you, right? Um, there's a lot of that in scripture. Uh, Jesus, when he resurrected from the dead, like suck around for a while. Like he didn't just resurrect and ascend into heaven, right? Like the resurrection and the ascension um, are on two different days, like two very different days, right? Uh, Pentecost is not right after Easter, if you haven't noticed. So in that time period, Jesus continued to teach the disciples, right? There's so many things that he taught them, the apostles and the disciples, so many things that St. Paul taught and showed people that isn't in scripture. And so you're just left with this question of like, what, what are all these gaps, like, what do you do with all of these gaps, right? Like, how do you, how do you make up for this um, in, in not being able to understand? And this is where, so I'm kind of jumping ahead to scripture versus tradition, which is my third point. Um, but Paul's letters talk about this, right? I, so I looked up uh, some stuff on the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And so uh, this, this is one of, of many things I think a lot of Protestants don't fully understand about Catholicism. Uh, my future sister-in-law, Mary, just got the Green Catechism. Uh, I forget what the actual title of it is. I'll have to look it up or ask her. But the, the good thing about the Green Catechism versus the little white ones is that the green one actually uh, has resources and sources back to everything that's in the Catechism to Scripture, which is, which is one of the craziest things. Like sometimes I think Protestants look excuse me, at Catholics and just think we're just absolutely crazy. This is why so many Protestants, when they start reading the early church fathers, when you start getting to like, just the same way we as conservatives will be like, we just want the freedoms that were guaranteed to us in the constitution, right? Early United States, the founding fathers, what they envisioned for the country, that's what we want is freedom, individual liberty. How do we not take that same approach and say, I want to worship and do things like the early Christians did. Instead, if you go into a mega church in a high school gym, with their rock band and their music and the lights and the funny pastor and their ripped jeans. That's nothing like what the early Christians did. And you're not teaching anything that they taught. And so it doesn't make a ton of sense. So if you go back and you read and you study the church fathers, the early people of the church, this is the stuff that you get. But even if you see here, the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, right? This Catholic um, place talks about uh, tradition. And so here it is in Uh, The letter to the Thessalonians, St. Paul says, so then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, right? You can go down even further, says, uh, this is a quote from their article that they have, and I'll I'll try to link this as well. Says the more specific meaning of tradition, capital T tradition, however, consists of the teaching that God himself, that is Jesus, delivered to the apostles, but were not completely recorded in inspired scripture. The fullness of the Christian faith cannot be contained in a book, even an inspired one. The ecclesial or church offices of Pope, Bishop, and priest, the rubrics and celebration of the liturgy, and the seven church sacraments are essential elements of the faith. These cannot be confined to a book, even though they were are part of the church's life in every age. These go back so far, guys. This is what I don't understand. Like this stuff is the early church. I remember reading a book. It's called A Simple Explanation of the Mass right? And, and Dynamic Catholic sells it, if you want to check it out. And it's written by a priest. And he goes back and he talks about not only the ways, like from early church letters, I'm talking about first, second, third century letters that Christians wrote to each other when they talked about how they worshiped and how, how their worship ceremonies went. It is the mass that we celebrate now, the words that they said, the actions that they did. 
And not only that, but it mimics so much from the Old Testament and the ways that the Jews actually sacrificed to God. And so Jesus being the Lamb of God, like, who takes away the sins of the world, like, we re-sacrifice him to the Father on the altar at Catholic churches at every Mass, and then we consume him as he instructed us to do in Scripture, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. The other thing that I don't understand about this, so obviously the church fathers, early Christians, this is what they did, which is so important. The second one is, dog, who do you think came up with the Bible? Who do you think came up with the Bible? If the church is fallible, so is the New Testament, because the Catholic Church came up with the Bible. So I just read to you all those denominations, right? It's not like, it it would almost make more sense if you saw... uh, Martin Luther went through and deleted some stuff out of the, out of scripture. He took books out of the Bible and he added some words here and there. Like he made some changes, which, you know, I don't think is good for your, for a brother's salvation. I don't recommend it, but it makes sense logically, right? Like if you're going to combat the church to say the church is fallible, the church is not the, the true church of Christ. I'm going to create the church of Christ, which is a pretty bold and prideful thing to proclaim. I think then you must be, uh, you must, you must have issue with the, with the Bible as well, because the Bible, like obviously the Old Testament books were written before Jesus, but all the New Testament books were written roughly by the end of the first century AD. So now I'm reading from Catholic.com, also known as Catholic Answers, answering the question, who put the Bible together in what year? The Bible as a whole was not, offic- going back to their, this is quoting them, but the Bible as a whole was not officially compiled until the late fourth century, illustrating that it was the Catholic Church who determined the canon that is the lists of books of the Bible under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, the Bible is not a self-canonizing collection of books, as there is no table of contents included in any of the books. Jesus did not sit down before he went up to heaven, before he ascended into heaven, and say, these are the books I want you to include in the Bible. So I know there's going to be some other gospels that are written. If you don't know that, there was many other gospels that were written of Jesus' life that didn't make it, the Gospel of Thomas and others. He said, you know, I know Thomas is going to write one, but don't include his. I want Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. And then uh, St. Paul is going to write a letter to this person, this, this group, this church, this church, this church. I want you to include those. Don't include these letters in scripture. Um, John's going to write this really crazy book called Revelation. I want you to include that. Like he didn't do that, right? Like these were people that did this. And so if you believe that people can form things, right? Like if you believe in what it just says there, that the Catholic Church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, determined the, lo- the canon or the list of books. If you believed that they were true then, then why would they, how can they not, how can that not happen other, in other ways? How can that not happen in other ways? That's the same way, the same discernment process, right? These councils is the same way that they determine things like uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, right? This is the same process they go through in discerning like Marian apparitions. Like Mary has appeared throughout the centuries over and over again. It's literally why the entire continent of Mexico is Catholic or not continent, country of Mexico is Catholic, but the entire continent of South America too. It's that's why it's because Mary appeared to to, uh, St. Juan Diego, our lady of Guadalupe. You see this image everywhere. It converted an entire country to Catholicism. Because Mary has appeared in so many places, hundreds of people witnessed the miracle of sun of the sun of Our Lady of Fatima. Like there, there's literally hundreds and thousands of people who have witnessed Marian apparitions and Eucharistic miracles over the over the centuries. It does not make any sense to me. So uh, continue to go on. So it says the New Testament canon was not determined until the late 300s. Books um, the church deemed sacred were early on proclaimed at mass and read and preached about otherwise. Early Christian writings outnumbered the 27 books that would become the canon of the New Testament. The shepherds of the church, by a process of spiritual discernment and investigation into liturgical traditions of the church spread throughout the world, had to draw clear lines of distinction between books that are truly inspired by God and originated in the apostolic period and those that were only claimed to have these qualities. Continuing on, this is our last little bit here. The process culminated in 382 as the Council of Rome, which was convened under the leadership of Pope Damasus, promulgated the 73-book spiritual canon. I say again, the 73-book spiritual canon. The 73-book spiritual canon, not 66, 73-book spiritual canon. 
The biblical canon was reaffirmed by the regional councils of Hippo, Carthage, Hippo in 393, Carthage in 397, and then definitely reaffirmed by the Ecumenical Council of Florence in 1442. If the, if the church is fallible or incapable of being infallible, then the New Testament is capable of being infallible, which also does not support sola scriptura. That don't add up. I don't get the math on that, homeboy. So talk to me now. Early church letters, post-resurrection, Paul's letters. Like, guys, it says about scripture and tradition. Now, I'm going to go to the other thing. That drives me freaking nuts about sola scriptura. I think I have this belief. Now, obviously, the, the Protestant Reformation was in 1517. So I think that he was still impacted by technology. But I think that most people today who believe in sola scriptura are really impacted by technology. Because I think it's really easy to convince somebody that uh, I think it's really easy to convince somebody that all you need is scripture if you have the Bible on your phone with you all the time. If you got the Bible with you all the time on your phone, why would you not believe that all you need is scripture? It makes sense because we're so equipped with it, right? What else do you need? You just need the word of God. And now understand, like Catholics don't downplay the word of God. I've, I've listened to and watched a lot of Protestant uh, uh, pastors, especially your Stephen Ferrix, Michael Todd's preach, and they don't read scripture the way Catholics do. I'm telling you, obviously a lot of Catholics, I know Catholics are, are notorious for not reading scripture and not paying attention to mass, but we read the whole Bible every three years. It's read completely at mass. We read from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, and the gospel in every single uh, Sunday mass. And three of those four in every daily mass, right? So pretty wild. But I think that people having the Bible app, I think it makes you be like, yeah, all you need is scripture. All you need is the Bible. And you have like stream churches online and podcasts, all this other stuff that you can kind of listen to and kind of subsidize if you are a supplement, uh, you know, not going to church. It's like, I'll just watch church. You know, I'm a little tired or whatever. I'll just watch it. It's like, dog, no, that ain't it. Tell me how, how you believe Everybody was Catholic until 1517, and you believe that all you need was scripture. But my friends, the printing press wasn't even created until 1436. For 1400 years, every copy of, of the Bible, right? Well, I guess that's not true for 1100 years since it was created in, in the late 300s. So let's say 1000 to 1100 years. Every copy of the letters, scripture, whatever, you know, was hand copied. Not only that, but I also looked up the literacy rate in 1600 for males, who were the only ones educated at the time, was 30%. That's in England. Literacy rate in 1640s in England was around 30%. That's what, 150 130 or no about a hundred or 1640s that's 200 years after the pretty press was created so printing press 1436 in 1640s one third of every male in england could read one out of three 200 years after the printing press was created so that's why i think that even martin luther might have been affected by the printing press being around for a hundred almost 100 years by the time he did his whole you know protestant reformation and, you know, started the Sola Scriptura stuff because he was educated. He knew the stuff. He had scripture. But like that's this is the stuff I don't understand. How do people go so long without scripture? Like you didn't have the things that you have now. There weren't people reading their daily reflections on their phone or their Joel Osteen videos and, and all this other stuff. Like we didn't have that back then. You know what people had? They had mass. They didn't have mega churches and concerts and all these things and flashy lights and millionaire, multimillionaire preachers. They had St. Francis rocking around, you know, balling out, doing his thing, trying to rebuild the church. They had St. Augustine going around preaching the truth. St. Nicholas going around slapping heretics, right? People couldn't read. They couldn't do these things. So, I, I mean, that's what I don't understand. Sola Scriptura, it might make sense if we all had access to Scripture 24-7. 
now, but how would God lead us with that? Leave us, you know, here on earth with no guidance of what books are supposed to go in scripture, none of that stuff. He would have had to been a lot more specific, in my opinion, for that to be true. If it was a soul scriptura, was Jesus' plan, he would have to have been a lot more specific about what was supposed to go in scripture and how we were supposed to have access to it. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. But what he did do was institute the Eucharist at the Last Supper and tell us to continue to do that and had St. Paul reiterate that in his letters and go around showing people how to do that and start to ordain people and created a first pope and gave us a lot of things that weren't written down in scripture. That's what Jesus did do. He did reference a lot of other sacraments like the sacrament of marriage, like the sacrament of uh, holy orders, like the sacrament of confession. He did do those things, but he never said that all you need is, is the books that people are going to eventually write. He, he said that zero times, like zero, zero times. Boom. All right. So then moving on diving back into scripture and things that Jesus said. So I don't know, this might be a long episode, man. I'm already pretty deep in the game, but uh, maybe we'll just continue on. We'll just Charlie Mike continue mission as they say. So I'm going to open up here. If you want to, if you have a Bible with you, or if you have your phone with you, because now in the 21st century, we have the Bible on our phones. Go ahead and open that bad boy up to John, the gospel according to St. John chapter six, that's six for those of you who don't speak Spanish. Now, what I truly encourage you to do is two things. One is pray with this. Two is uh, watch this video. It's called like the hour that will change your life by Father Mike Schmitz. It's from Seek in 2015. We were in Nashville. I was there. Life-changing talk. I was really struggling with like belief in the true presence of the Eucharist up to that point until I heard this talk. And after that, I never, nothing was the same, as Drake would say. Everything was different. So this is what he does. He's going to do it much more in depth in that video. I'll put that video in the show notes as well. Link to it here on YouTube. If you're watching me, if you want to see my ugly mug, as I said, all these different things. Um, but I got my Bible open. I'm using the revised standard version, uh, Catholic edition, sold on Dynamic Catholic. This is the New Testament only um, in this book that I have here. Uh, I feel like I've done a lot of Dynamic Catholic ads today. They're not even paying me anymore. Chapter six, John chapter six talks with the feeding of the five, starts with the feeding of the 5,000, right? So you're probably familiar with this. Um, you know, the, Jesus is like, we got to feed these people. Uh, you know, my man, uh, my man is just shook. Uh, all the people are like, we don't have enough money. The apostles are like, bro, we're broke. Um, Jesus took these loaves that they just yeeted from this uh, young buck. Uh, this little lad who had five barley loaves and two fish, he was stacked compared to everybody else. Um, and they just said, let me hold that real quick. Jesus did some plickety plow on it, and the baskets were overflowing. Filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. All right, so I just gave you a really, really terrible summary of what happens from verses 1 through 15. Um, then, I forget that this is in here. In verses 16 to 21, Jesus is out here just, just tramping, tramping on water, right? Walking on the water, walking on the sea, drawing near the boat. Dudes are just freaking out. He's like, chill out. It's me. And they're like, who's me? And he's like, Jesus. That's how I assume it went. And then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. On the next day, uh, the people came around. Right. And so Father Mike basically breaks down that there's like three people in this story. You have the crowd, you have the disciples, and then you have the apostles. Right. So the first, you know, Jesus, the day before, fed them, you know, fed the five, what was it, 5,000, right? Yeah, fed the 5,000. Next day, uh, he's like, you guys are just coming over here uh, because you want to eat. Right. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Right. Do not labor for food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him has God the Father set his seal. That's on verse 27. Then Jesus said to them in 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So he said to him, what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you or believe you? 
What work do you perform? Our fathers ate man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Now, listen to this. So I told you there's three groups, right? You got the crowd, you got the disciples, you got the apostles. Jesus loses a lot of people this day. A lot of people walk away. They decide to bounce. Jesus says a lot of analogies in scripture at different points in the gospels. Jesus says, I am the gate. Um, you know, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And nobody says, oh, this dude's crazy, right? Like he's not making any sense. He uses a lot of analogies. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? Like uh, that's not an analogy, but you know, to say that he's the way, like would be confusing for people. Um, but nobody says like, you're not a road, like you're not a path, like you're a person, right? Uh, nobody says you're not a gate, you're a person. Nobody says you're not a vine, you're a person. Um, like he, he no, uh, nobody, like he, he says that he's the shepherd. Like he, nobody says you're not a shepherd, you're a carpenter, right? Like he uses a lot of analogies. So the idea that he's using an analogy and people get pissed off doesn't really add up because he uses analogies in other places and nobody cares. They get it. They're like, okay, it's an example, right? He speaks in parables. That's like his whole jam is analogies. But Jesus says to them, after they say, Lord, give us this bread always, Jesus said to them, I'm in verse 35, 635 here. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So he continues on, the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Now check this out. Verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now check this out again. Jesus makes analogies throughout scripture, analogies, examples, and parables. Nobody ever trips. There's no other example of this. But in verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now they're already getting kind of mad before and Jesus called them out and said, don't murmur among yourselves. Then he goes on and says even further, your fathers ate man in the desert. They died. I am the bread which came down from heaven. The life, the bread that I give to the world is my flesh. Then they continue to get upset, right? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's disgusting. He's talking about us eating him. That's cannibalism. This boy's tripping out. He sounds crazy at this point, right? So at this point, if you're Jesus, and this is an analogy or a symbol, as many uh, of our Protestant brothers and sisters would have you believe, this is a great opportunity to clarify. If you've ever been misunderstood, misinterpreted, after you've said something two or three times at this point, you might want to clarify and be like, no, I mean, like, like I like, you know, like spiritually feed you, you know, like my words give you life, you know, like scripture and stuff. Um, like, like scripture, like I quoted to the devil where I said, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes to the mouth of God, like, like, like that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like I kind of, I feed you like metaphorically. Instead, what does Jesus say? Verse 53, holla at me, Jesus. He says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh, of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you now to me that doesn't sound like he's dabbling in this idea of eating and drinking my man said truly truly i say to you my man said like truly truly jesus says truly truly before he's like i am not messing around he's like listen to me right like look at me this is like how i talk to my dog i'm like luna look at me this is how he's talking to us Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, 
unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That sounds like a problem. That sounds like something I want to do. He who eats, and then he goes on, verse 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's no other church that I know of. I mean, there, there's some churches, don't get me wrong. I think this is something that not a lot of uh, pro, uh, Catholics know, is that there are certain churches like the Lutheran Church, and I think it's just Lutherans and like Orthodox who believe that they still have like the true presence of the body of Christ in communion. The Catholic Church would say that they do not, or that, that, uh, that uh, Lutherans at least do not. And others just do like pure symbol, which is another thing that I think is pretty crazy. Uh, I'll share that to the end. Cause I want to finish this, finish this in, in scripture here. Cause this is, yeah, this is a long part. I knew it would be long. So then he says, I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus verse 55 says for my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living father sent me. And I live because of the father. So he who eats me live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Now, what about that? Sounds like he's clarifying it to sound like he's being metaphorical or a symbol. Martin Luther, when he broke off from the Catholic Church, Protestant, Lutherans still believe in the true presence of communion, that they're eating the flesh uh, and, and blood of eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus at communion time in Lutheran churches. They believe that's what the Lutheran church teaches. At least a majority of them do. So like Martin Luther, when he like the first Protestant believed in the true presence. Like he believed this. He believed also known as believing scripture based on what Jesus himself is saying. This isn't even like somebody else in some random part. Like this is John chapter six, Jesus's words. And he says it over and over again. The next verse, verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Other translations say, who can accept it? 61 says, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Like, do you not believe what I'm saying? Like, what about when you see me in my glory? Will you believe me then? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. So Jesus continues on there, right? Verse 66 says, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. So the crowds murmured and fought about themselves, his disciples. You have to understand that his disciples, dog, his disciples are the people who like left stuff to follow him. Like if you've watched The Chosen, these are the people who like gave up things. Like these weren't just some people, these weren't some passerbys, right? Like the crowd might've been some people who just got fed, but the disciples had been with my man for a while. Like they left their jobs, their families to follow him. Jesus then took, looked to the 12 and said, will you also go away? And Simon Peter, also known as the first Pope, also known as St. Peter, also known as the, the, the original o, or the OG of, uh, of the papacy, the papacy. That was hard to get out. St. Uh, Saint Peter said to him, Lord to, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed him. Come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Dude. I don't know how people don't believe in the Eucharist. I think if you, like, this was really powerful when Father Mike goes through all of it. He does a much better job than I did. Uh, I, I highlight some of his points there. But he did that, and then they did, like, a Eucharistic procession, and people were weeping. There was not a, a single person, Protestant, that came with us on that trip that wanted to be Protestant when they left that day. Because if you believe in the Eucharist and you don't, you know, I had friends who came and, and became Catholic after that that said, my parents always said, you can't just pick and choose parts of Scripture that you like and parts that you don't. I've never, I've never had a friend of mine, a Protestant, like, look at me and read that Scripture verse and be like, yeah, you know, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's not what he meant. This is just a symbol, man. It's just a symbol. Now, I got another podcast coming out here soon with uh, my man, Noble Gibbons. And, or I think it's the same week as this one comes out. I have to check the schedule. But one thing we talked about in that was regards to like different things in, in the world and especially politically, how we get manipulated by the government and how people don't really want to face the truth a lot of the time because uh, it, it's, the truth is demanding. Right. The truth makes you the truth demands answers. 
the truth demands that you change your life sometimes. And so that's why I think that a lot of times people don't want to look into this and people don't want to learn more about the church. People, I, I've always said that like, you don't have to be like worked up about defending the Catholic church because the truth defends itself. So if people look into it, I mean, how many people you see this with, with atheists becoming Christian when they try to prove Christianity wrong, right? Lee Strobel is a great example of this, the case for Christ, the case for Easter. He's written a lot of books since then. But I think he was a lawyer and tried to like, or a historian, I can't remember, and tried to go through and like prove Christianity wrong with like history and like, like just kind of digging into like a lot of the things that he doubted. And he ended up becoming a Christian. There's been uh, Muslims who have done this, but there's a lot of Protestants who do the same thing with Catholicism, dig deeper and try to prove it wrong and end up becoming Catholic because they're like, holy cow, this is overwhelming. So we have a lot of great books that are written about that. Um, Rome Sweet Home is Scott Hahn's version, uh, his story. Um, Confessions of a mega church pastor by my friend Alan Hunt. We actually did a podcast with him. It was like one of our first 10, I want to say. So you can go back and listen to that. We talked about his journey uh, from being a mega church pastor, a Methodist, um, becoming Catholic. And a lot of it had to do with the Eucharist. But a lot of times, like I said, the, tr- the truth is demanding. So I'm going to wrap up here because I know we're at an hour, uh, a little bit over. But the, the number five, the reason why I'm Catholic, and I think a lot of people don't want to look into this is that the church stands for something. And yes, like I said, the church has done a lot of bad. We, we've had a lot of, the church hasn't done bad, but the, there's been a lot of scandals and things that have come out of members of the church. Uh, a lot of evil deeds and things have been done, right? We're all still sinners that make up this body of Christ that is the Catholic church. But one thing that I think is funny, even if you look at like movies, right? And we've always laughed that they like, when people need an exorcism, like in a, in a scary movie, they don't call the ripped jeans mega church pastor from down the street. He never gets to come. <laughs> right? I, I don't understand. Like it's never the, the Stephen Furtick, when you need an exorcism, when you, you encounter some seriously dark shit, right? Like when, when things are really bad, somebody's possessed by, by a demon or, you know, there's a satanic presence or things like that. Like they don't, they don't take you to that guy. It's just, it's just not what's done, man. Like that's, that's, why is that? Like even Hollywood knows and, and, and how many exorcists have examples and, and proof have talked to demons who are possessing people. There's countless examples of these. You can go back and listen to a lot of uh, Father Ripperger's stuff. Father Chad Ripperger, look at him up on YouTube. And they talk about how much the demons are terrified of Mary and Joseph, right? Mary, the mother of God, the rosary, uh, her name, like when she's invoked for her intercession. Same with St. Joseph. That's why one of his titles is the terror of demons. But then also look at the martyrs, right? Like people who have died for the faith over the years that have kept Christianity alive for the first 1,500 years, all of them are Catholic. Uh, the pro-life message and traditional marriage. I, I, one of the things that like I used to, I used to even like still go to mass and like listen to Elevation, listen to Stephen Furtick. Um, and there's another podcast on uh, The Spillover with Alex Clark where she talks to somebody who used to be into like magic and um not just magic stuff like i'm not talking about like fun like sleight of hand magicians but like dark dark magic and uh like yoga and um like card reading and all that kind of stuff and she talks about a lot of these mega churches and how bad they are now she has her problems with catholicism as well and i think she's a little bit miseducated about it but i had a similar experience as hers where you start to realize like the reason why all of these pastors, a lot of them, like Stephen Furtick, who I listened to for years, like I'm not talking, I listened to him like twice. Like I've read three of his books. And I listened to him for like three years, like almost weekly. And I was like, he never preaches on anything that's difficult. He never preaches on anything that's divisive. And Jesus very clearly and specifically in scripture tells us that he came not to unify, but to divide. That there would be mother against father. Um, mother against son, sister against brother, you know, husband against wife, like it would be divide, like he's a divisive figure in history, right? Like G- like the real Jesus, not the nice like 21st century, like politically correct Jesus, but like the real Jesus was divisive and he said some divisive things. And I started to realize that my favorite priests, like Father Meyer, like Father Mike, um, like they they preach these pro-life messages. They preach about the importance of traditional marriage they preach against socialism and all of its evils uh but you don't hear that from Stephen Furtick 
you can you can stay you can stay very much the same person you are and go to Elevation Church for years. And you can do that, unfortunately, in a lot of Catholic churches, but you can't argue that the Catholic Church doesn't stand against abortion. So many of the leading causes, like the Students for Life, uh, like Abby Johnson, like Live Action, and Lila Rose, um, are led by Catholics in the, in the pro-life movement. Even, even people who are fighting against the death penalty in the United States a lot of times are Catholics, compassionate Catholics. Uh, traditional marriage. I mean, the church is an ardent defender of traditional marriage, right? Not as much as we should sometimes, but we don't do any of that stuff. And there's people who will lie to you and say the church is going to change, it's going to bend, it's going to grow and, and evolve and all this stuff, and it's not going to happen. It's not because it's not what Christ wanted. So I just started to realize, man, the church, like there's been 113 attacks since, um, was it July or November? I don't know. There's a list on the USCCB website. I was just looking at it last week of attacks of vandalism, destruction, spray painting, hate messages on Catholic churches. We've had like five in Denver, um, 113 over the last like year and a half. They don't, they don't do that to elevation. Antifa doesn't go in and spray paint and destroy and, and rip up uh, pro-life crosses and stuff like that at Elevation Church's parking lot or their, their, their grounds because they don't do that stuff. And they make millions and millions of dollars doing this and preaching these messages of prosperity and all this stuff. And like, you can kind of live however you want. You can, they don't talk about uh, birth control. They don't talk about um, abortion. They don't talk about pornography. They don't talk about uh, living together before marriage, cohabitation. They don't talk about traditional marriage. They talk about any of this stuff. I, I personally, I mean, if, if, if Stephen Furtick has talked about this, please send it to me. But I'm telling you, I listened to hundreds of hours of Stephen Furtick and never heard him mention any of those things. I will give Michael Todd that he'll occasionally talk about like sex before marriage and things like that, but I've never heard him really preach a pro-life message. I see the same thing. I have the same issues with like Lecrae and all these um, Christian rappers who I love. But I have the same problem with a lot of them. They get they'll they'll get they'll get bold and piss off conservatives and, and support BLM and support all this other stuff and talk about conservative Christians and, and you know I heard Triple E in his last single talked about uh, Republicans and how bad that you know what I mean like but they they will never call out Democrats they'll never call out uh, you know they'll, they'll talk they'll like say like yeah passively like I'm pro life but they'll they'll talk a lot more about BLM than they will abortion even though abortion has killed over sixty million Americans in the last fifty years. So the church stands for something. The last thing I want to talk about is universality of the church. I think one thing that's really powerful um, is when you get to go to mass in a different language. When you go to mass in in Mexico, I've been to mass in uh, I've been to mass in Lithuania. I've been to mass in Afghanistan. I've been to mass um, in a lot of different countries in a lot of different languages. In Vietnamese, I've been to mass in French. I've been to mass in Latin, and you get to experience that universality. I remember being in Lithuania, I was 19 and I had like my mass readings up on my phone and I knew that the church that I was in, I was in the cathedral in Vilnius, Lithuania, and they were reading the same readings that my church back in uh, Pennsylvania or Maryland was reading. I knew when we were getting to the consecration, I knew the words that the priest, even though he was speaking in Lithuania, I knew the words he was saying over the consecration because it's a Catholic church, it's a universal church, they say it everywhere. We are one. We are unified. The same thing that Jesus himself, when he was praying to the Father in Scripture, in the Gospel of John, prayed that we be one, that we be unified. Since 1517, there's been over 30,000 denominations created of Christianity. About half of Christians in the world are Protestant, half are Catholic. Of the Catholics, you might have people who disagree with things within the church. But we have the catechism and we have scripture and we have tradition that lay out the teachings of the Catholic Church. And nobody can say that the Catholic Church teaches anything different than it does. Of the other half of Christianity, you have Protestantism, which is divided over 30,000, I think it's over 33, 35,000 times, including every time this little new church starts and, and, and Stephen Furtick is the Pope of Elevation Church. Because I think I always think that's so funny how, how Protestants will be like, well, the Pope, you shouldn't have one leader in this. It's like, what do you like? Every organization has like an org chart. The army, your job, you know what I mean? Like everything has like a CEO down to the like, 
you just need that for a big organization. You have to have organization. And Jesus knew that. So that's why we have a Pope. Stephen Furtick just happens to be the, the ultimate source of interpreting scripture and everything at his church. And so that's the other thing with scripture that I forgot to mention is like the interpretation of scripture. We're not meant to just like discern it on our own because how do people come up with such different ideas? If it's just so easy to like determine it on your own and what it means, how are there so many different ideas? Why do you have so many churches who are pro-gay marriage and, and against it, pro-abortion and against it? If scripture is so, is so clearly understood and it's so easy, it's meant to be just discerned by the individual. Why, how, do we, how do we all read it and then come up with different, different ideas and answers? That's why we need the church. We need the church to interpret scripture for us. So that way I can check and give my benefit of the doubt to the church and say, I don't understand this verse. What does the church say about it? And you can go back and read centuries, centuries of church teaching on that scripture. So I just want to encourage everybody, if you haven't done the, uh, excuse me, the old, uh, if you haven't watched the Father Mike video, if you haven't looked up some of this stuff, um, I'm going to link a lot of things in, in this uh, caption or whatever, you know what I mean? But uh, check out if, if you're listening to any of this anywhere, like it's going to be on YouTube, it's on the podcast, it's on Instagram. Pray with some of the scripture, get a better prayer life. If you haven't downloaded the Hallow app, the Hallow app is the best way to pray um, or a best way to learn how to pray if you don't have a prayer life now. Uh, and you can't be a saint without a prayer life. It's impossible. And so just now I lay me down to sleep or bless us, oh Lord, does not count as a serious prayer life. And I want you to be a saint. I want you to live the best life that you can live. Um, and so I encourage you to check out our link uh, to download Hell. It's a great way to support us because we get a little kickback from um, when people use our link to, to download and use the free trial. Um, you don't even have to buy it, but if you just start a free trial, then it helps support the podcast. Um, and you also will help get a lot of benefit in your prayer life. So share that with people, if you will. Again, as I said at the beginning, if you haven't left us a review, please do. It goes a long way, um, helps us get the message out. Share this message with somebody who'd like to hear it or who you'd like to hear it and uh, have some discussions around this stuff. Learn more about it. If you're a Catholic who doesn't know these things and you're not formed on this stuff, but if you're a Protestant, what are you protesting against? That's what Protestant stands for. You're protesting against something you've broken off from the church and you might want to have a good reason why. Um, for the rest of us, I encourage you to take this stuff more seriously, to read more scripture and to go to uh, mass more often, go to confession more often, um, and just genuinely continue to fight hard and strive to be your best. Know that we're here for you. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode. God bless.